Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Hitler, when he came to power, had very few international connections and he distrusted elements of his own civil service. What he needed was people he could trust who were connected to the highest echelons of power throughout Europe. These emissaries would be used to sound out opinion and smooth over incidents when they happened. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this episode. These back channels, the aristocratic go-betweens that Hitler employed. But before we get there, if you do enjoy my eclectic look at World War II, why not become a patron of the podcast? You might buy a history magazine each month. How long will you spend reading it? An hour? Two? I provide around two hours of podcasts each month for free. And for patrons, sometimes a little bit more. This is all made possible from listeners like yourself becoming patrons of the show and donating a dollar or two each month. To find out how it works, you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash ww2podcast or click on donate on the website ww2podcast.com. Right, so joining me today is Karina Urbach. Karina is currently working at the Institute of for advanced study at Princeton. Her book, Go Betweens for Hitler, was published in 2015. Karina, thank you for joining me. Shall we start by defining what we mean by go betweens, these these back channels? Well, it's important um, to understand that these are private individuals, they are not diplomats, and they are um, people in high places. They are useful to politicians and to statesmen because they are connected internationally um, with their counterparts in other countries. So that's why everybody used them. You know, they, they were used in um, by monarchs, by democratically elected um, governments, and also later on by dictators. I mean, Hitler used Use them a lot too, and they were useful because um, you could disown them if something went wrong, if the bank <laughs> channel didn't work. And you said, "I've never ever instructed this person. I don't know who you're talking about." And and because they were they were discreet and loyal and and had their own um, code of honor. So um, yes, they were ideal. And because the nobility was so internationally connected. They were the ones that did all this go-between work until 39. I mean, uh, today, of course, go-betweens are completely different people. You wouldn't use um, uh, the nobility anymore now. You would use businessmen who are internationally connected or scientists. It's very funny because here in, in Princeton, I met um, a Freeman Dyson, a physicist, and he told me that during the Cold War, it was scientists, you know, who were used behind the scenes for uh, talking to Russians. So, I mean, the, the method is never going away. We can see it with Trump. At the moment with um, North Korea that he used people as go-betweens and so on. So it is still there. It was just that in the period I looked at, it was um, the nobility that was best connected and used. And scientists, presumably, because that you can move them between confer- international conferences uh, without being seen. That's right. And it's probably the same for those aristocrats pre-war when they're going to various social functions around Europe between their relatives. That They are exactly, yeah, because they were visiting their family family um, or cousins abroad and nobody ever asked any questions and the interesting thing is um, that women were used a lot and that's of course surprising because you know women um, didn't play any part in diplomacy until 45 I think only the Russians had had one um, female diplomat and that was so shocking for the British when when she first arrived you know <laughs> the, the, the king had to receive her as the new ambassador from the Soviet Union and he was saying yeah but she's a woman you know I can't can't receive a woman <laughs> ambassador that has never happened. So for us, of course, this is bizarre today, but that women could play a part in this clandestine work before the Second World War, that's, that was yeah, new, novel. How did they go about it? I mean, what was the procedure for the, you know, the way this works? I sort of have in my mind sort of a cross between sort of I don't know if you've read P.G. Woodhouse and those those parties that Bertie Wooster gets sort of invited to, uh, <laughs> but something with a bit more gravitas of sort of Downton Abbey. Is that what they sort of uh, orchestrated meetings? Yeah, that, that's that's pretty much. I mean, they they had all these country house meetings, and and that's 
just you know we know that from remains of the day and it's a wonderful novel and but they actually did take place and for example with the duke of coburg whose sister um is related to queen mary and and george v she invited everyone to her little country house um nobody of course would have sus- suspected anything but she invited the duke of coburg her brother and ribbentrop there and and mixed them with british politicians with the pieces so um this was all low key this was totally off the radar and no politician on for, you know on the other side or anti appeasers or any journalist would ever hear about it so that that was really well done and in the first world war they they met a lot in in switzerland and neutral countries of course and it was just um, I have a few cases where, you know, they, they meet in, in a hotel lobby, you know, a, a female um, aristocrat and, and somebody from, from the French and the British side. So, yes, it was all done very, very properly and um, uh, behind the scenes, but definitely behind the you, scenes. You mentioned the Duke of, uh, Duke of Coburg. He, you know, he started life as Charles Edward. That's not how he ended it, though. It was... Yes, I mean, he is a really bizarre case because he was ordered by, by Queen Victoria um, to take over the, the duchies of Coburg and Gotha. And when he was only 15, he was um, a schoolboy at Eton. And he was just unlucky in some ways because actually his, his uncle should have inherited them, but he didn't want to go to Coburg. <laughs> so this little um, Charles Edward, Edward was sent over and um, he changed his name from Charles Edward into Karl Eduard, so he became really German. And it was a sort of re-education program, but it went totally um, wrong in, in many ways because he really turned into the worst nationalist German you can imagine. And um, during the First World War, he distanced himself from, from the British royal family. He is actually the trigger for them changing their name into Windsor because that, that's something that is never told and I find that really bizarre Then he is the one who first kicks the British relatives out of the house of Sachsen Coburg Gotha. He says during the war in 1917, he says they are no longer members of the house of Sachsen Coburg Gotha. And then, of course, George V has to react to that because he has lost his name and he has many other problems at that time as well because Gotha bombers have bombed um, uh, Britain, of course, but he hasn't got a name anymore. So he has to change it into Windsor. Yes, it's, it's this, this little um, Duke of Coburg who um, plays a very sinister part in the 20s and 30s and then becomes, you know, fry court. He, um, he supports them financially. There are all these reactionary right-wing groups in, in Germany in the 20s. And then um, he falls in love with Hitler and finances him. So, yes, a very um, dark figure. I wondered if... Uh if with the First World War he sort of felt he had to become a, almost like a super patriot to um, to prove his Germanness, and then he almost got suckered into it uh, you know, as things went on. Yeah, yeah. I was involved with some TV documentary uh, that was about 10 years ago, and they were very sympathetic to him. They they said, oh, this poor man, you know, um, it wasn't really his choice. He was sent over there. And, and, and of course, that does play a part. I mean, must have been a culture shock, but not that much of a culture shock when he came over because his mother was German and he had all these German relatives and so on. But he, he I think he was really characterized, not a very good person either. So it, it wasn't just, you know, bad luck. It was his character. He could have been more uh, democratic like um, many other um, former dukes in Germany. I mean, they didn't become proper Democrats, but they didn't become Nazis either. <laughs> so he, he had a choice, you know, he had a choice. How, how did it work? So how did it work for him? Did he, did, did, does Hitler approach him or did he approach Hitler to become a a, a, a go between. I mean, in some respects, the the pairing of the two almost seems. You know, you've got the one hand is sort of the revolutionary Hitler, and about someone as arist- aristocratic almost as you can be. They're kind of uh, the odd couple. That's something that is so um, fascinating about um, the NSDAP, the Nazi Party, is playing to all sides. So there there are people like Strasser and um, and uh, Goebbels who absolutely loathe the nobility and they are more on the left for a long time. I mean, Goebbels then changes his ways. But Hitler doesn't care. I mean, he, as long as it's um, helping his party, 
party as long as they give money he creeps up to everyone in the 20s you know he tries he tries all these um, industrialists because he wants their money he tries the German nobility he chats up everyone and they fall for him because he he says he's anti-Bolshevist and that's that's what they want to hear and he he um, charms them he says how much he admires the traditions of the nobility and so on and they yes they do support him um, tremendously and uh, Karl Eduard is, is not the only one I mean especially aristocratic women for some reason I don't know fall in love with Hitler it's it's pretty disgusting yeah, and then uh, sorry, you asked about um, how does he use him? Well, yeah, because Hitler doesn't have, um, of course, when he starts off in in, um, in the twenties and also until thirty three, he doesn't have any international contacts. You know, they um, to to people like Mussolini, he sends over Goering to Italy because he wants Goering to charm Mussolini, but that doesn't work at first. So um, what he does, and it's super clever of him, is um, he uses the House of Hessen, which is an, a German aristocratic family and their ties to Italy, for example. And they make it possible because they have Italian, they have, um, one of them is married to the, the daughter of the Italian king. So they can make it possible uh, for Hitler to get into contact with Mussolini. And they are the icebreakers and they really uh, give him the international context that he lacks. Is the civil service aware at all of what's going on with, with these... Uh these uh, aristocrats sort of floating around Europe? The, the German Foreign Office is, um, of course, yeah, at first they are full of conservative people. There are some Nazis in the uh, German Foreign Office, but not enough, according to Hitler. And um, <laughs> he's trying to infiltrate them, and he absolutely succeeds. I mean, at f he doesn't trust his own Foreign Office. That's one reason why um, he uses these back channels and uses the nobility, because he, he trusts the House of Hessen and Coburg and, and Hohenzollern, they also work for him. So he trusts them completely, but he doesn't trust his own diplomats. But then, of course, um, during the 30s, the diplomats completely turn around and, and support Hitler and um, Weizsäcker is a famous case. And they, um, he doesn't have to, to worry about them not being loyal. But it does take some time before the foreign... And, and of course, the foreign office is terribly jealous of these uh, go-betweens. They do find out. For example, there is a Bismarck... Um, the grandson of the famous Otto von Bismarck, he is in London and, and he is very upset when the Duke of Coburg is turning up, running back channels with Ribbentrop and is, is jealous. He's just jealous. But then, of course, he outshines him by becoming the super Nazi himself. So creeping up to the, <laughs> creeping up to the new emperor, the new court. Hitler is the new emperor, the new... Yeah, so they become his courtiers again. I mean, they are good at being courtiers. That's what the nobility is uh, trained to be. Well, it amused me when uh, the Duke of Coburg manages to be in London every time something happens. You would have thought if somebody had been watching him, they could figure out that Hitler was about to do something because uh, the Duke's in town. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, I mean... When you look at him, yeah, you would recognize him anywhere. So um, it, it is suspicious. So he's doing this country house hopping and he's staying with his sister and trying to hide. But some go-betweens, of course, like um, Stephanie Hornlow, they were that they were picked up. They they were on the journalist's radar, and that is. Um, in her case, is is a problem for her because um, one of them sees her coming out of Halifax's private home, um, and that that's the end of her work because after that she has been outed and she can never work again as a go-between. Well, she's interesting because she work she although she's working for uh, the Germans, she's also paid for by British press magnet Lord uh, Rothermere, isn't she? That's right. I mean, this is very, I mean, this woman is unbelievable. She always finds somebody who pays for her and she's for, she's financed by so many people. It's very difficult to find out. She never did a tax return, so we won't know who. And, and she might not have declared it anyway. So she always got these presents. So I guess jewelry and so on, you don't have to declare. So yeah, she's starting off very early in the 20s and um, they, she's first paid by Rothermere, then also... Um, um, the Hungarians are paying her, and then she manages to be paid by Hitler. But the idea was that Lord Rothermere, the, the Daily Mail owner, of course, wanted to get in contact with Hitler. I mean, first she, he wants to get in contact with, with the um, emperor because Rothermere has this big idea to get the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns back on the throne. Um, but he gives up that idea and then turns 
comes to the new people, the dictators. It struck me as being rather pragmatic in some respects, because some of the, you know, obviously some of these aristocratic families will have suffered uh, at the end of the First World War, presumably with their uh, properties being divided up between various nations. Yeah. Uh, often they're they're in terminal decline because the the, you know, the, the money is now elsewhere. Uh, and it struck me uh, as being rather pragmatic if you can latch on to um, to being one of these go-betweens because it gives you a, a sort of power and status that you might not otherwise have, have fiscally considering what's happening in the business world. Absolutely right, yeah. For them, um, the revolution is such a shock in, in 1918 and losing... For example, many people had um, uh, property in in Hungary, the, the all the Austrian um, uh, nobility, of course, and now they, they have lost that, or they had um, property in Schlesien, which is now Polish, and um, the Pless family is fighting for this Polish property for ages. And there is also this, they have no more status. I mean, that is so uh, demeaning for them to be just normal citizens now. And to understand, I mean, it is a horrible shock for them. And of course, they, they as Associated with with Bolshevism, and and that is their their biggest threat in the in the twenties and thirties, and and of course they um, are very anti-Semitic or becoming very anti-Semitic because they think Bolshevism, well that means Jews, they they are obviously um, running that show, so um, they become even more anti-Semitic than before. I can't find it. But I did might make a note of. I wonder if these people are more. You know, it, it, it's uh, Hobson's choice. If if they you know, it, it's a, an aversion to communism rather than. A, uh, an affection to uh, to the Hitler and the, uh, and the Nazi Party is the, is the greater uh, driving force. Yes, uh, yeah, definitely, yeah, and that, that I think that's also the the case in England uh, because you have this uh, feeling in the 1920s that you know, the empire is getting undermined by communism, and and of course that's not um, un- completely untrue, not at all. I mean, there there are um, the idea is of of Lenin to to have a world communism, and of course they are trying to hit Britain in the empire and they have all these common turn information about what is going on in Afghanistan that um, the, the, the communists um, are getting weapons in India, etc., etc. So they are absolutely right to fear it. That they turn that far to, to the right in, in reaction to it is, of course, the consequence and not the best consequence. I mean, but it is, explains the um, appeasement um, policies of Chamberlain and um, that he doesn't, just doesn't want to talk to the Russians. I mean, it's sort of been British. It's the elephant in the room. So, how does this fit in with the British, the British royal family? Because they, they're, presumably they were a prime target for uh, for these these go betweens as they come to Britain. Yeah, they were really the prime target, and the Duke of Coburg uses his links. He uses the the um, relationship that he, you know, is also a grandson of Queen Victoria. He uses his sister because his sister. Alice Aslan is married to Queen Mary's brother, so it's a bit complicated. So Queen Mary is a tech, and she has a brother, and um, and the brother marries the Duke of Coburg's sister. So he is the one who um, gives the Duke of Coburg a lot of PR in England. He gives um, him the country house whenever he w- wants to turn up there with Ribbentrop. So uh, the Duke of Coburg has a lot of conversations with the Prince of Wales, the later Edward VIII, and and of course also helps helps him when he's Duke of Windsor to have this big PR tour of, of Germany in 37. But yes, he does try to use his influence on the royal family and he is received by, by Queen Mary naturally and um, is is coming to Sandringham after Christmas and and things like that. So he is in in England all the time and uses all his contacts. And the the royal family is, you know, very hospitable to him. And he, of course, sells... He's not the only German relative who sells Hitler to them. I mean, he he paints Germany in the most um, rosy picture. And that's the same thing the House of Hessen does, the Duke of Hessen, who also very closely related, and the Hohenzollern, who also come over um, and then... And the Duke of Coburg also has this close connection with the veterans group in Britain and, of course, with the Anglo-German fellowship. So they they try it on several levels to influence the British appeasers. Well, what, what I found uh, interesting was the uh, concentration, perhaps, on, on trying to, to uh, nobble the royal family onto sort of winning them over. Because I wondered if it showed a, a, a lack... I might be wrong, but a lack of a kind of 
ha- where the where Britain was politically, because ultimately power didn't at all lie with the royal family, and I'm not sure really how much uh, how much they could swear the government if the cho- if the government chose to do its own thing. They're obviously, the the, the 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 royal family had nothing to. Do. But I wonder if that that doesn't come across sort of necessarily from <laughs> uh, a dictatorial Germany at the time. Does that make sense? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, um, it has often been said, you know, Hitler totally uh, over had has this overblown view that the royal family is still pulling the strings and so on and so forth. And and of course they are, they are not. I mean, they are in the um, they they can only do things or influence indirectly behind the scenes and so on and so forth. But um, they are. I mean, uh, in the in in thirty eight and um, in the thirties, very much on on Chamberlain. Side and and we know from Queen Mary that she does support um, the Munich Agreement and she does um, support Chamberlain's appeasement policies. We know from George VI that of course he does have a great interest in the Spanish monarchy coming back to Spain, so he is not critical of Franco. That is something important to know because he is related to the Queen of Spain who hopes that her son can come back, that Franco will call back the, the monarchy, which was was um, everybody thought that at the time. So, I mean, they are not fascists at all, of course, but they have an interest in, of course, supporting these old families be getting back into power and um, supporting on the continent authoritarian regimes and, and not necessarily democratic ones. A- appeasement sort of a dirty word now, but I, 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 I'm I led to believe that, uh, I think it comes across, I might be wrong with those mass observation reports, that actually p- people were, were uh, if I thought, I'm not sure if it, with the word appeasement was used at the time, but we're, we're pro you know, avoiding war at all costs. So, you know, the royal family may very well have been in 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 step with uh, public public opinion, which perhaps <laughs> Churchill, when it comes to power, isn't, but convinces everybody to follow him. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Yeah, they were definitely in step with public opinion and um, the majority was uh, pro-appeasement. And so, yes, that's what they are following, really. I I think uh, to understand why they were so pro-appeasement, it's really uh, important to know that it's because of their anti-communism, anti-Bolshevism, and they they feel threatened, not not just at home, because the the British. I mean, there's not even there's I think one communist in the House of Commons, so that that is that is ridiculous. But they feel threatened in the empire, and they are right to feel threatened in India and in China. Even though China is not part of the empire, but China is their biggest trading partner with India. India. So they, they, of course, they feel threatened that communism will take over and, and they have every interest in therefore supporting authoritarian or um, fascist regimes in, in other countries. And, and that is what they are doing behind the scenes. Did they have any I was say stunning victories? Uh, that's not necessarily stunning successes. That's the word I was looking for. Did they have any, any, any big coups, uh, successes? These, these go betweens. In the First World War, of course, you know the Germans weren't very successful with their go-between work. It, it was there was a big scandal with the Austrians. They uh, they had a go-between called Sixtus, Prince Sixtus, and when he was uncovered, um, it played a role in in the Habsburg downfall. Really, they there were successes. For example, for for the Duke of Coburg, when he is a uh, go-between during the um, naval agreement in, in 35, and uh, he sees, of course, the Rhineland um, demilitarization in 36 as a, a big success. But there are lots of people who claim that they were the ones, like Hirsch and the Ambassador Hirsch, and and so on and so forth. So um, yes, I mean they they had short-term successes, certainly. Yeah. yeah I presume the British must have done the same in reverse. Who is working for the British in Germany? Ah, yeah. Well, that is of course more on the on the spy side then. So, yeah, I think that um, there there is this um, very interesting figure. Um, he's called Christie. He is working as a naval attaché in 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 Germany, and he works as a go between for um, Chamberlain and um, von Sittard for a while. And he also is involved with um, peace talks in the 90s. 
19, in 1940 when, you know, during the phony war, they still think that, you know, that there might be, it might be possible to, to get um, a peace deal. They, they send a lot of people to Switzerland during that time. And, um, and there are also strange things happening in American hotel rooms in 1940. So, yes, they use mainly uh, military people to, to do these go-between things. Oh, uh, so we weren't exporting our own ability to Germany for uh, for. Ah, uh, so uh, well, you were in a way because, for example, um, in in 1939, there is the Duke of Kent coming over and working as a go-between, um, still hoping to avert war, which is, of course. For, for some people, that's something admirable. He is coming over, um, sent by George VI to talk to um, the Duke of Hessen, who reports to Hitler. So there are still, um, yeah, definitely um, high-ranking aristocrats coming over from the other side as well. Were there countries where these go-betweens just didn't, these, you know, these German go-betweens just didn't work? Yeah, you know, I'm kind of thinking that you know, perhaps... Um, the United States or perhaps France. You know, the yeah, France. Yeah, because it's republic. Yeah, it's a republic, and and um, they couldn't really get to the top there. That's right. I mean, Stephanie Hohenlohe, for example, has horrible problems in France. She gets arrested once, and uh, it's not her seat. But in America, she does try to to work for Hitler, and 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 the Duke of Coburg is sent to America, which is also very funny. But um, he does meet Roosevelt in in um, in Washington. And he also meets Molotov. So he, that's of course, um, I think 39, he is um, over there. So yes, so they, they are sent to, even um, he's, uh, the Duke of Coburg is sent to, to Soviet Union. Stephanie Holland, she, she curiously ends up working for the OSS profiling Hitler. She sort of turned, turned sides. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But the poor man who, um, the OSS guy who has to interview her, she gets him into horrible trouble um, because she immediately, um, of course, wants to get out of prison. She's interned in, in, in America as an enemy alien. She says, I cooperate with you um, if you get me out of here. And he, he can't. And then she slacks him off and says horrible things about him and so on and so forth. But, um, yeah, she was very useful. Um, of course, she was always lying so much. I don't know how much you have to deduct from from her report about Hitler, but because she was so close to Hitler, and for some reason Hitler really was charmed by her. We don't know why, but um, she she obviously um, had some impact on him, and so she is quite useful. And a lot uh, a lot of former Hitler um, admirers who who flee to to America, like Putzi Hamstenger, who was very close to Hitler in the 1920s, of course, try to explain him. And yeah, it's quite it's quite funny. She's one of the women. And then, of course, there is also another, um, the daughter of Winifred um, Wagner from the Wagner clan. She's also giving the OSS um, a profile on Hitler because she knew him since she was a child. So what happened to, to all these people after the war? Presumably, they would have been picked up. Uh, by the Allies? Yeah, I mean, the, the Duke of Coburg is the only unlucky one in in some regards because he gets interned by the Americans and he, of course, immediately um, complains, you know, he says, oh, I'm related to Queen Victoria, get me out of here. And um, <laughs> and then his sister, as usual, his sister descends on Germany and, and tries to get him. She writes a horrible um, report, letters home, saying, oh, you know, these Americans, there it is, this, this, um, American Syrian guy, and then there is this this Jewish guy, and and how how can they not release my wonderful brother, and and how can they represent America? I mean, she more or less is snobbish and anti-Semitic, saying they are not good enough to be in charge of of Germany. So um, yeah, she gets him out. She gets him out, and um, and he then dies in 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 the 1950s. And yeah, he everybody says he was broke. I mean, he wasn't that broke, but he still had a house, and and um, and he was uh, financially all right. I, the others did better. I mean, Stephanie Honlo, she's amazing. How she um, reinvented herself and then becomes a society hostess in America, and and uh, and even works for um, the White House again. You know. I, 
after Roosevelt, during 1940, Roosevelt says, get rid of that horrible woman, you know, send her to Vladivostok. I can't see her anymore. She's troubled. She's dangerous. And so. And then when, when Kennedy comes back into the White House, she somehow manages to um, become, you know, a go-between, a fixer in this. I mean, she is working for newspapers then, and she fixes an interview for German newspapers with Kennedy and uh, Johnson, President Johnson as well, yeah. So uh, it's amazing how she survived. And she dies um, in Geneva in the 70s, super rich and happy. Again, pragmatism, you're, 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 uh, you're fading out aristocracy. If you can float to the uh, as close as possible to the circles of power, hopefully some of that will shine back on you to give you some sort of relevance in the in a changing world. How on earth did you manage to document all these off-the-book activities? Is it a matter of getting everyone's social diaries together and uh, comparing dates? Oh, it was it was really tough. I mean, because um, in Germany, um, they had all these denazification trials, of course, after 45. And that meant that lots of people burned everything that they could, um, you know, would be incriminating. So it is very, I mean, the Bismarck family is, difficult to get access to the um, the Coburgs had to burn a lot of stuff but they thank God um, the Duke of Coburg had these little um, pocket diaries where he writes all the appointments it's a it's an appointment book really and he writes in um, who he saw and how long and sometimes he writes what they talked about so he saw the the Queen Mother our I mean your Queen Mother um, who died um, of course Queen Elizabeth and all these things so 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 he is he's pretty good I mean the, the biggest problem I had is this the Royal Archives and that's why I'm still having this crusade for them to open up their papers because it is it is quite outrageous that all these papers are still closed after so many years. For example, we have nothing I mean, on Edward VIII, on the Duke of Windsor, all his papers are closed. The Duke of Kent's papers are closed. We, we don't have them at all, and we know that he was um, in the 30s going to Germany a lot and talking to high-ranking Nazis. So I find it a bit um, shocking that nothing is happening on that front and that there's not more transparency because the Royal Archives are also financed by, by British taxpayers' money. Oh, well, I was going to say, is it a private archive or is it, in theory, a public archive? In which case, does it sort of fall under those various rules like governmental archives where you get your 50 years rule and your 100 years rule? Ah, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, um, they don't have any rules. So, um, of course, you, you would say, is there, will we ever see, you know, Edward VIII's papers? I mean, will they, do we have a chance in 100 years or in 150 years? And then they claim, no, we are a private archive. But, of course, it's not private because this is the state papers of your kings and queens. It should be a public archive and it should be not just official biographers who can access these important papers from the 1930s. I mean, the the Royal Archives have released things, uh, Queen Victoria's diaries, and that's wonderful, and it's digitalized and online, and that's um, and that's very public spirited. But of course, they uh, are very selective in releasing papers, and that is the the shocking thing that they are controlling this, and that they are giving us no hope and no date when we can ever see um, these papers from the 1930s. Is there a sort of a cutoff point where they? start getting sensitive about what you can see can you see see everything up to the start of the first world war ah that's difficult because we don't know what they have you see they don't <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't, so they don't a, let you into the catalogue that's right that's why you know i did with my uh, german colleagues with uh, john davis and franz bosbach we um we wanted to document all the um before 1914 we wanted to document all these papers they have for anglo-german relations so we we did publish two catalogues on this, which was uh, it cost the German taxpayer an enormous amount of money. It cost uh, 500,000 euros. So we did um, catalog up to 1914 everything they showed us. We don't know whether it's everything they have. But um, <laughs> when we asked, you know, can we see papers for a later date? No. And um, of course, they have an internal catalog. They have a catalog, but um, that is not online and nobody knows what is in this internal catalog. So we will never know what they have. And so what you can do is you can write to them and say, do you have anything on, you know, 1917? And then they will write back to you and say, yes or no so you have to trust them that they're telling you the truth so it's a bit like one of those dan brown books where he's talking about the vatican archives and no one really knows what's in there <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very similar. I mean, it's like it's like the KGB archives. It's the same thing. You can't go in there and and you can write to them, but they they probably won't reply at all. At least uh, the royal archives do reply when they say no. no I, I was sort of on the assumption that up to a set date you'd be allowed in, and then it would be a rolling as people either passed away or over a set period of time, you'd be allowed in. No, unfortunately, um, there's no room. And that is, I, I think, really the, the big problem. And that's why the Times and, and also um, the, the Guardian were running these campaigns and, you know, said, open up your archives. I mean, this is really um, hindering historical research. It's not that we are interested. I know that they are probably had affairs and illegitimate children and all that stuff. But I, I think we are not interested in that. I, I can understand that you want to hide these very intimate things but it's political papers people are interested in and um, should have a right to mm, in, indeed indeed Thank, thanks Karina let's, uh, let's leave it there uh, if you would like to discover more about the remarkable lives of these men and women who acted behind the scenes for Nazi Germany Karina's book is Go Betweens for Hitler I'll put a link on the website www.podcast.com if you want more World War II, don't forget you can find me on Facebook where I do post things in support of the latest episode. And don't forget, for patrons, I do release exclusive bits and pieces. And you can find me at patreon.com slash ww2podcasts or click on donate on the website ww2podcast.com and join the mailing list. That's it for now. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.